And that's where I learned about sales, good, bad, and the ugly, and made a lot of mistakes and saw how to communicate with people, how to make people feel wanted, valued, uh, saw when it all went wrong as well, which was a great learning curve. And then mum said, you can't work in the pub anymore. We want you to go out and get an education and get in that. So I left and worked in the Commonwealth Bank for 11 years and then moved over to sales. And I've had an absolute ball, met some fantastic people and just enjoyed life ever since. Welcome to Wellness Spring, our one-stop shop for education, inspiration, motivation and optimal wellness. Learn from top experts and exceptional people. Welcome dear friends to Wellness Springs. I am so blessed to have a special guest with me today. Rob Elliott, who is an exceptional sales and business coach, public speaker, and fellow author and podcaster. Rob's podcast show is called The Real Journey of Success. And I am blessed to have been interviewed by Rob twice, all thanks to a communal friend, Marav Tarka when we um, were celebrating the success of our collaborative book, Lady X, and became a number one bestseller. And again, last October on our anniversary, we did a special relaunch and we became number one again. And it was so much fun to be with Rob because he is just a, a, an amazing soul and he's got a real real um, art of communication and helping you to relax and he gets all the gems and nuggets out of you and hopefully I can get the gems out of him today because he is a sales guru so and I also um, love his tagline on his show and I've also seen it in his book the I hope you can see it hang on the sales chain, yeah. Um, his tagline is, have a groovy day. When he first said it, I thought that was so sweet. I couldn't help but smile. I was thinking of Austin Powers in that era. So um, hopefully we're going to have a fun day. So welcome, Rob, to Wellness Spring. Beverly, thank you so much. Uh, it's beautiful to have such a lovely introduction. So uh, let's hope we're going to have a groovy podcast. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. Um, as you know, I've been at the Elvis show all weekend and you've been at the cricket. So we're both um, yes. filled with beautiful, high love energy. So I like my audience to get to know my um, guests and go into yes. the nitty gritties because anybody can read about your bio and your background and about sales. But who are you mm. really? Like, where were you born? Can you tell us about your family, your education, and where you grew up? Born and bred in Sydney. Uh, mum and dad. Dad was an electrician and mum worked in an office. And they had a, what you call a life-changing event, where my dad was offered the chance to go and run pubs for a company called Tui's. And so I actually never lived in a house until I was 26. And even then it was a unit. I'd always grown up in pubs and it was amazing. I mean, back in those days, they were pretty wild and woolly places. But I grew up in a place called Bankstown. That's where I spent most of my time, which is in southwest Sydney. It was a fantastic place. It was full of all these different cultures, all these different nationalities. And we had a ball. And I was privileged enough to go to a school on the North Shore called St Aloysius, big private boys school, not as big as a lot of the others. And so I had totally two different things. I had living in Bankstown, very working class, very straightforward, straight talking people. And then I went to the North Shore. And in those days, the North Shore were uh, a lot rich uh, people and kids growing up in a totally different environment to mine. So I had this chalk and cheese every day. 
both very good people, but as you say, your environment shapes who you are. And they didn't always see things the way I saw them and vice versa. So, but I looked, I loved it. I was privileged, had two great parents. They put off actually buying a home so they could put me through school. And that's where I learned about sales, good, bad, and the ugly, and made a lot of mistakes and saw how to communicate with people, how to make people feel wanted, valued, uh, saw when it all went wrong as well, which was a great learning curve. And then mum said, you can't work in the pub anymore. We want you to go out and get an education and get in that. So I left and worked in the Commonwealth Bank for 11 years and then moved over to sales. And I've had an absolute ball, met some fantastic people and just enjoyed life ever since. Wow. Like you said, that was very much chalk and cheese. Mm. And, you know, we never know who or where people come from their background because I do a lot of mm. yacht racing and you never know who's sitting on the rail with you. Could be a pauper or could be a multimillionaire. And uh, I actually sailed flying 11s in Sydney. Ah. Not very well. <laughs> Ended up in the drink on the Parramatta River underneath the bridge once and I thought to myself, hmm. Maybe not the the boy from Bankstown really should be out in the yacht. <laughs> oh, as you know, practice makes perfect. So you just needed to jump on that horse again and take it by the reins. So it was and very never... cold in the middle of winter on the Parramatta River. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, well, I hope you don't mind me sharing, but I think it's relevant for the show because I read in your book also. Mm that you were born with cataracts on your eyes and yes. you were bullied yes. at school and you yes, actually was. went to six different school, uh, five different schools in six years. And mm. I just wondered if you could share that because bullying is a huge thing worldwide. You know, things mm. haven't changed since we were kids. And, yes. um, you know, I'm wondering from your take, having suffered so much, um, you know, how could teachers and parents change this so the children the children are not traumatised? Look, I think growing up, I went to, all those were in primary school, and that's just the way kids were. Kids are very cruel, but they don't mean to be cruel, especially younger kids. So I wore what we would call Coke bottle glasses. My mum had rubella, which was German measles before I was born. So I was actually lucky only to have bad eyes. Mm. And like since then, you know, technology has come through. I've had three operations and it's a lot better. But when it comes to bullying, you can take it the other way too far where a lot of parents, you know, they run and they wrap their kids in cotton wool mm. and say, oh, no, they run up to the teacher and the principal every time. I say to parents, you need a little bit of bullying to give teach resilience. Now, now, what I mean by a little bit of bullying is I don't mean the nasty stuff. If you look at it now, there's a reason why, why someone is bullying your son or daughter. And there's there's an issue in, at that child's home that's making them react that way. Where a child is being bullied, if you wrap them up in cotton wool and don't teach them resilience, I was actually talking to a high school principal just before Christmas. And I said, him, what's the biggest challenge you have at high school? He said, Boys and girls are very aggressive. They want to fight. They want to bully. And I, he said, I said, where did that come from? He said, a little bit of COVID, a little bit of helicopter parenting, a little bit of everything. And so what I say in primary school, you need to be much softer. You need to teach your children, well, you know what? That boy or girl's obviously got something that's making him angry. That's when you teach a child to turn the other cheek mm -hmm. as much as they can but don't take a backward step. And I think that's important. You can turn the other cheek, you can be nice and you can stop the bullying, but never ever take a backward step. Because to a bully, that means they've won. And by me, not taking a backward step is stand up for yourself, but in a much nicer way. When it comes to high school, they're far larger, far bigger. So Parents have to be supportive. We told my son he went to a boys' school. I told him that if you ever hit someone first, you won't get any support from me. If I hear you're ever bullying someone, you won't get support from me. But if someone hits you first, you have our permission to defend yourself. 
Wow. And that's a big thing. Children need to be taught resilience. They need to be taught that what's happening to them is wrong, but not necessarily you need to say, okay, well, how do I handle it better rather than going to cotton wool? The, and sometimes the bully can end up being your best friend. Mm. That's, that's, you know, it's every child is different, but uh, there's, it's fault on both sides. More, of course, worse on the bully side. Uh, I grew up in western suburbs of Sydney with going to school with ultra wealthy kids. Yes, I got bullied a lot. In the end, I had I stood up for myself. And to quote rugby, there's nowhere to hide on the bottom of a rugby ruck or mall. <laughs> if I didn't stand up to myself, mm. stand up for myself, I would have been in bigger trouble. But I would never condone violence. There's more ways to do it. Wow. Uh, and as it comes to social media bullying, I know it sounds simple, but unfriend, block, and turn off. That's really bullying good doesn't advice. exist unless you see it. You can block someone. You can unfriend someone. And you can turn around and say, be it Twitter, be it Instagram, be it any of the plethora of social media platforms. Take a break for two days. Just talk to your friends on Messenger. Because if they're your true friends, they'll message you. Ignore it. If you ignore a bully, they eventually go away. Nine out of ten. And the ones that don't go away, there's more serious problems there than we have time for today. But uh, I think, to, I think, in sum it up, parents need to teach resilience and don't and don't ever condone violence. Wow, that's really good advice. And I like the way that you said that you had to learn to stand on your two own two feet, because mm. um, recently I was talking to a friend and she's dyslexic and got bullied mm. in school, and the teachers treat you mm. as if you're an imbecile and her two daughters yes. are the same so she she told them look it's only a label you've been given and you mm. know all I ask is that you stand on your own two feet so she doesn't mollycoddle mm. them or any or wrap them no. in cotton wool as you say she said in life you know anything can happen so you really need to stand on your two feet if we're not around and always look for a solution. And that's what you were saying. You know, I think mm. a lot lot of people are so quick to reach out, help, 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 you know, and expecting yes. people. And the more people do for you, the less you stop thinking and um, acting in an appropriate way. Oh, look, how true. I remember speaking to a couple of school kids one day. And I said, do you realise at school, you know, the cool boy or the two girl, cool girl that gets all the dates and gets all the attention? They went, yeah, yeah. I said, you walk out of that school at the end of year, uh, sixth form or year 12, as they call it, that doesn't matter anymore. They're nobody. Everybody is nobody. You are then in control of what goes on around you. Wow. Everyone is equal. That's and they so did, true. said, we never looked at it that way. Yeah. Well, you talked about social media and obviously mm. you and I didn't grow up in that era. We were blessed not mm. to have grown up in that era. Yes. And yes, how, true. Because I work a lot with women and children, mm. I know how stressful it can be on social media, like you're talking about bullying. And um, yes. even the Dalai Lama said, you know, one of the biggest causes of stress is social media because children mm. as adults as well but he was talking about children well before they go to bed they look at their their posts whether it's on tiktok mm. or whatever the children are using mm. now facebook to see how many likes and then they're comparing themselves with other people who's had more likes and more comments and so forth so and the same in the morning they have a restless night because they're all wired up and then in the morning yes. the first thing they do they check so True. um and adults you know instead of waking up naturally and allowing your body rhythm or if you have to put an alarm on to go to work you know just go to the shower and have your breakfast and things like that but what tips would you give to any parents or adults listening now about social media? Social media now can make or break you in many ways. It can make or break your relationship. It can make or break your job or it can make or break your business. 
My wife had a great saying when she ran a political office. When they made a decision about if they were going to run with a press release or a photo, that was, will it look good on the 6pm news? Or will it look good on the front page of the paper the next day? And if you look at that to start with, with what you're posting, will it look good on the front page of the paper the following day or on the news? And you go, no, don't post it. Wow. Because it will never, once you post it, you can't get it back. You can delete it, but it's still out there. When it comes to social media, the same thing happens, especially today. If you go and apply for a job or you set up a business, the first thing a lot of people do is go and look you up on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. You've got to be so careful of what you're saying or what you're doing or lock it down. I say to a lot of people, especially in business, before you start that business and before you start promoting your business, people know who you are clean your Facebook feed and lock it down. Clear all the people who really are not your friends and only have it available to people who you know are friends, which you can do. As for being on it all the time, I mean, we're all guilty of it. If, if you say you don't do it, you're telling big fibs. But to me, if you're going to start the morning with a clear mind, which is very important to everyone, you shouldn't go anywhere, you shouldn't turn TV on, you shouldn't turn social media on, nothing. Get up. I always say do five or ten minutes of exercise, have a shower, have a cup of tea or a juice and breakfast in peace. And the rest of your day will be set in peace. If you get up in the morning and start with stress, guess what? The rest of your day will be stressful. And the same, I, I look, I'm guilty of it, but I would say to people, don't go onto social media at least a half an hour to an hour before you go to bed. You've got to unwind. You've got to turn that, bring the, we call it, and you and I call it the vibration in your brain, in your body back down. You've got to be in a calm state. If you are being a, but you're a slave to your phone, who's controlling who? The phone's controlling you. You should be controlling the phone. Very good tips. And I totally agree with everything. And I would just like to add just to, instill in your mind you can either meditate or just focus on your breathing so for years I've given mm. people tips like if if you feel like you're struggling and you're pushing a wheelbarrow uphill full of stones just stop mm. and take a deep breath in and a deep breath out and think okay if I was coming from a state of peace or love how would mm. I approach this and I just think yes. as you said you know and I in the mornings, I like to visualize my day, you know, and see it all going smoothly and give gratitude because I think gratitude is a great way to start your day and it's the highest vibration. Anyway, um, from Here we our go. He, this is the real <laughs> questions coming now. You've softened me up. Yes, I've softened you up. So got you in the groove. And um, as we were chatting earlier, I mm -hmm. used to teach networking for business mm -hmm. success. And yes. having read your book, The Sales Chain, I found a lot of similarities in the way people mm. sell and to the way people network. So mm. would you like to um, talk about why you started, your, why you printed your book, uh, wrote your book and so forth? What inspired well, the book, you? The book came... The book came about because people said to me, Rob, why don't you put it down in words? And I looked around and I searched, and would you believe there's no books out there for people starting in sales who have never sold before? Wow. A plain, easy-to-read book. There's plenty of books out there on sales, and they've got all these strategies with these big words, and you must do this, and you must do that. And all they do is confuse and overwhelm. If you're confused and overwhelmed, you can't sell and these days, people don't sell. And it's it's funny. People say, what do you mean you don't sell? Well, used car salesmen, that type of selling has gone. Uh, using certain strategies, yes, you can go and do NLP and I can teach someone how to manipulate someone's feelings and emotions to get the sale. But is that the right thing to do? No. Is it fair to manipulate someone who may not quite be as switched on as you and get them to buy something that's not going to be what they're right for them? No. 
You sell them what they want, but you give them what they need. And so I wrote the book purely so people could go through it. It's easy reading. Uh, my wife was at my editor, so whatever I wrote, then she put back into layman's terms because I have a habit, like a lot of us do, of talking in technical terms. But people needed to learn how to speak, how to own the room, how to question, how to listen, so many different things, and how to be themselves. And so we decided to write the sales chain. And it all comes from personal experience. It all comes from true stories. As you know, I have some contributors in there that have, who've been there, done that as well. And I'll tell you what, there's nothing in there that I haven't stuffed up myself, that I haven't made a mistake on. And I, I always say to people, if you're getting a coach from anybody, if they haven't made every mistake possible, then they're not the right fit. Someone says, I've always done everything right. No, 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 no. You've got to make those mistakes. You've got to stub your toe. You've got to blow a sail. You've got to get your face slapped. You've got to get all of that if you're truly going to be successful. And the book's just based on my personal experience and when I have got it right and when I have got it wrong. And it's an easy read and people went, thank you. You know, now I can just pull, pick the ball up any time and look up each chapter and say, wow, you know, now I forgot what I was supposed to do and I'll go back and do it. Yes, and I totally agree with what you're saying. And I love the way the book is set out and you've got the summary at the end of each chapter. Mm. And as you mentioned, I know one of the contributors, the lovely Alicia mm. Sedgwick, who, by the way, says hello and sends her love because I told her we were chatting today. And yes. um, all the way from is, Monaco. Yes, all the way from Monaco. And she is a communication genius. And I just wondered how you met your contributors and why you chose them, because they're all exceptional people when I was reading them. They're all successful, but not necessarily world names. So when you, I look for people who I have a connection with, who are in all different, I mean, one fronts a band. One's a real estate agent. One's a communication expert. They're all so different, but they all sell. And people have got to remember is that everyone sells in every single business. We're all in sales. And all these people are ultra successful. So the, the, the best way to learn is go and find someone who's successful, see what they do and copy it. It worked for them. And so I approached them, and I think out of all the people I approached, I only had one person said no. Wow. So I think, you know, that was awesome. Uh, and I was actually humbled to get the people I did. And when I read their contributions, I went, wow, you know, it was uh, it was amazing. And then you see them perform on stage, you see them perform in real life in, in their business or wherever, and you go, that's why I chose them. And they're real people. No one got paid. Everyone did it from their, from their heart. Uh, and I actually think some of them had to sit down and think, well, really, how do I do this? I'm very good at it, but what am I doing? So I hope that comes through as well in the book. Oh, it did. Um, you know, like I said, listening to Adam Thompson singing, because he's mm. such an icon here in Australia. Mm. And I think because there's so many lonely people out there and not mm. everybody likes Christmas a lot of people get really stressed mm. and anxious because they could have lost loved ones they could mm. uh, have um, had a breakup um, mm. with a partner children are not there etc cetera, etc cetera. so many reasons and a lot of people are not religious and you know mm. I personally find it's um, overrated it's all about commercialism I and the, on telly, you hear them talking. We were in Melbourne about how many billions were sold on mm. um, uh, Boxing, uh, not Boxing Day, Christmas Eve. And each mm. day, then you had the Boxing Day sales, and then you got the New Year's sales. And it was all about sales, sales, sales. And I think um, it just went all out of control. What is your take on that? Look, I, I'm a, I'm a slightly different. I, I, I think a lot of people give presents as their way of saying to people, I love you. To me, I'm a person of faith, so it is it is about faith. But Christmas isn't just about what I believe. Christmas to me is it doesn't matter what faith, what religion, where you're from in the world, it should be just a time at least of coming together with family or friends or who you choose to be your family 
mm. and giving thanks. Giving thanks for your friendship, giving thanks for supporting each other, just to stop. That's, to me, the essence of Christmas. And it doesn't matter from what faith you're from. That's what the, it's all about. It is comes back to that call, let's stop and give, be thankful. And as for commercialism, I think people, the the press and business do go overboard with it. But we are all in control. We control how much we spend, not the big companies, not the press. So if you spend too much at Christmas, that's your own fault. It's not theirs. If you're all about commercialism, that's your choice, not ours. We were lucky enough. We have a 14-seat table in our house, and my wife's parents came down from far north, New South, uh, far north Queensland. My daughter came with her husband and, and grandkids. My son came in the afternoon with his partner. And my auntie and uncle are in their late 80s and one she's got dementia. So it was a challenging day. But we had all of them together. And to me, that's Christmas. Because we don't know who will still be here next year. Yeah. So, so we were so grateful to have so many, gener four generations eating at the same table. A lot of people don't get that. And I'm blessed. Uh and you know, it doesn't matter. We've had Christmases when we've had what we call orphan Christmas, where no one's had anyone else around. We've just had all friends over who didn't have anyone else around. No other family. So let's just come to our place, have an orphan Christmas. Same thing. Uh, you know, yeah. to me, Christmas is what you choose to make it. My old, our old doctor is uh, Indian, very proud Muslim man. And he loved giving Christmas cards at Christmas. Hmm. That was his way of saying to people who went to him, thank you. Yeah. Well, I don't believe, I, I, I despise the term happy holidays. It's not a holiday season. It, I cannot it, stand that. That is a personal view. I just don't like it. It's Merry Christmas and Christmas is what it is to you or me. It's not dictated by any book. Yeah, well, the world has changed, as you know. And it has. We... It has. Yeah, I I had a similar um, Christmas with Brian's family. And as mm. we lived in different countries, we've also had orphans mm. Christmases. So it's about mm -hmm. the gathering and the connection. Anyway, people yeah. do buy on emotions. And as you're the sales they do. guru, <laughs> do yes. you want to just tell us about, you know, tips on um, why people buy, what motivates them? Look, I'll, this, a lot of people turn and say they'll buy a dress. They'll go home and say, oh, duh, I bought this dress. It was 50% off. They bought the dress because they like the dress. But you go home and justify it with fact. Mm. So one's an emotional sale, and then you know you've got to justify it logically when you get home or vice versa. A good salesperson, if they're listening to your emotions, will use them against you to make a purchase. So you got to, what we do in sales, we call it's creating a need, creating fear of missing out. Do you like that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great product. Yeah, I love that. What do you like about it? And it's just you play on the emotion and you can get someone to buy something. I say to people, if you're buying a house, if you're buying a car, never, ever buy on emotion. It doesn't matter how much you love something. Of course, you don't buy something you don't like, but... If you look back in all your life and all your bad decisions, I think you'll find eight out of 10 of them were made emotionally, not logically. And there are people that are only do logical and they're very hard to deal with. Uh, but from a sales point of view or business point of view, it is good to create warmth. It's good to create the needing. If you go in to a shop and you're not treated nice, you won't buy there. But if you're going in and they say, G'day, how are you? How can I help you? Very softly, you're made to feel welcome. You are more than likely to buy from that shop. So in sales, you always need to look after your customer. It doesn't matter which level. It can be your website. You can have a horrible website. That website's not welcoming. Customer won't buy. Your experience all the way through, as we call it the sales chain, is to keep your customer emotionally engaged and feel welcome. If they then buy, fantastic. If they don't, they don't go away with a negative. If they go away with a negative, they're going to tell 10 people. So right. it is all about channeling that. It really is. Yeah, it's 
as we talked earlier, like it's about reading body language. So you've mm. mentioned websites and you've mentioned internet and social mm. media. Um, we've, mm. We're just coming out globally of two years of isolation and restrictions, and we've yep. been forced to go online. And yes. um, many people, you know, have lost their jobs or for whatever yes. reasons, or their jobs might not even exist. Mm. And they've been looking within and following their passion. And, mm. you know, what what would you say to these people? Because I know your tagline is like people by people or your they motto. Do. And it's the same with networking. You know, when you want to meet people, mm. it's about body language, building that rapport, connecting. When you're online, um, have you mm. noticed in the last two years, um, how has it affected your business and what tips can you do because I have found that people are listening more online because you haven't got the distraction if you're at a big event or in a shop looking over there mm. or looking over there. But what has been your experience with your sales business and sales coaching? You've got 20 seconds when someone goes onto your website for them to yay or nay. That's, that's the honest truth. Yeah. I would say to people, your front page, which is your first page, clean and simple. Who you are, what you do, and how you can help them. If you can solve someone's problem, they will click further. If you can't solve their problem, they're not going to. I would say as well, you need to have a podcast if you have an area of expertise. Giving people small 10-minute tips if you're in pest control, if you're in clothes making if you're in accounting it gets them engaged again further and once every time they click on something else on your website it brings them further and further and further in what a lot of people didn't do when we went to online is they didn't update their website they didn't update their instagram their linkedin all that they kept it as it was most of the time websites were used for a name phone number location uh -uh, not anymore you're still doing, even though the, it's now adjusted itself, you're still doing 30% of your business purely people are purchasing online. So that online has to be as close to a store experience as pop possible. You have to say thank you. Someone places an order. They always give an email. Straight away, there should be an email going back to you. Thank you very much for your purchase. We'll be in contact with you soon. You contact, contact, contact. Give them a text, give them a call. If they're buying quite a lot, what's wrong with picking up the phone and saying, hi, it's Beverly here. Thank you for buying those $30,000 worth of diamonds from me. I really like to say value your business and I hope to uh, speak with you soon. You don't have to speak to them. A 15 second message is all it takes for them to go, yeah, wow, she took the time. A handwritten note when you, if you're sending out something, in a package. My wife orders a lot of her dresses online. She said, you know, you should see her face light up when she opens her envelope, pulls the dress and there's a handwritten note in there. Thank you very much for buying from so-and-so. Big difference. You need to apply what was before to digital and to install. You just need to change the method of delivery. And then when you think you've got it right, give it to your harshest critic within your family and let them pull it apart. Great, great. Because we all look at things through rose-coloured glasses. We don't see the forest for the trees. Or in a sales term, we become store blind. Oh, we, we can okay. look at something so often we don't see the spelling mistake. Right. Well, that's and it doesn't matter if you're being if you're a coach, if you're being uh, personal development, if you're doing sales training like I am, you need someone to review. I've looked at things when I wrote a chapter and Rachel's walked in and threw it on the desk at me and said, what were you writing here? Wow. I said, may appeal of sense to me, <laughs> but I needed that person who was very honest with me to get me to rewrite things. Yeah. And you need to do that. As we say in a, in a real life situation, I've taken managers out and get them to walk in the front of the store and say, would you buy from you? Wow. Same thing with your social media, same thing with your website. Would yeah. you buy from you? That's great to take a step back. And it was good that you said, you know, you've got 20 seconds to sell. 
because it's like the mm. elevator pitch in networking. You, you, mm. You've got 20 seconds to sell yourself. And if they're interested, you've got another 30 seconds to um, engage with them and go deeper. So it's like you've got 20 seconds to look at the landing page and then click on something that they want from the products on the website. But um, for complete novices, especially like yeah. because I'm in the field of holistic, um, mm. many people will say, yeah, I'm more of a person. I, I can do my job, but they've got fear of speaking in public. They've got fear of ah. selling themselves. But you and I know that everybody is selling themselves from the day they're born. You know, you line up for something yeah. in the supermarket and you're selling yourself, you go to parent teachers mm. association, wherever you go, even if it's buying a coffee out with girlfriend sports club. Mm. But yeah, what would you say to them that are frightened of talking? The, the fear of talking doesn't exist. It's only in your mind. And yes, that's harsh. Oh, yeah, yeah, but you can do it well. Okay, I couldn't always. I'll be honest with you. Mm. Uh, a gentleman once said it to me who was a tradesman. I can't go and sell. I can't do this. I said, you know, when you were young and single, I went, yeah. I said, and you're at the pub, and he went, yeah. What happens if you saw a nice-looking girl across the bar? Oh, I'd walk over and say hello. And you would, what? You would sell yourself to her, wouldn't you? Yeah. I said, so what's the difference? I said, take it. I, I always go by the mantra of, how do you eat an elephant? And they go, what do you mean? I said, how do you eat an elephant? I said, one bit at a time. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be a Tony Robbins. You don't need to be a Grant Cardone or an Alicia Sedgwick. What you do need is confidence. Little, little bits. Start with when you go to the shop, ask the guy or the girl who's serving you, how was your day? You don't know them. And you watch their face change. Oh, someone spoke to me. You only have to interact with someone for 20 seconds. 20 seconds becomes 40 seconds. 40 seconds becomes two minutes. If you're nervous, I say remove the name and it's what you label it. You and I understand that we control the emotion. We put labels of emotion on every situation. So instead of saying I'm nervous when I'm speaking, say I'm excited when I speak your stance will change. If you're walking on into a meeting or you're walking into a big room, you don't know anyone, tell yourself, oh, I'm excited to go to this, not I'm nervous. If you say I'm excited, your shoulders will lift, they will go back and you'll walk in. And they're little things. And just practice a little bit every day. You don't need to be the best speaker in the world, but the more you do it, and if you say to yourself, I want to speak to one person every day that I don't know, just a simple, how's your day going? All of a sudden, each time you do that, the brick comes down one by one until you have no fear at all. And if they don't talk to you, who cares? We're going to get that in sales. You're going to get that in business. Yeah. It's a totally different thing. You and I can talk, but it's a totally different thing about walking on stage and talking. That's a whole new segment. That's, that's very different. But uh, that's a lot of fun. I call it fun anyway. Yeah. Uh, it's walking out on stage. I'll do very quickly. I had to do a keynote on what we call Anzac Day in Australia, which is a very important day in Australian uh, calendar about what happened many, many years ago. And I had all my notes when I first, very first started talking. And I had written this speech. I'd taken days. I'd put hours into it. Spoke about my auntie and all that. Walked out. It was an outside event. About 500 people walked up with my notes, put the notes down, looked up, and the sun was in my eyes. <laughs> Could not see a thing. <laughs> and I went, hmm. So I just spoke. Nobody knew what I did or didn't say. No one knew if I made a mistake. I walked back and I left my speech up there. I realised <laughs> then you don't need it. Fantastic. I teach people to speak without notes. I've stood next to prime ministers, treasurers, governor generals, ambassadors, and watch good and bad speakers. 
and some of the best speakers, and I say to this all the time, speak from the heart. When you are speaking about something that you're truly passionate, beat your business. Holistic people, I want to improve your life. Speak from the heart. But remember, especially in sales, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason, and that's exactly the percentage you should speak. Have an open question when you speak and then shut up and listen <laughs> and watch. and Listen with your eyes, which is what we call body language. Yeah, and let the person speak, and they'll tell you what they want. They tell, they'll tell you what they need, and all you do then is answer their questions. Yeah, it might sound simple for you and I, but that's it. Is you start practicing that, you won't have a fear of speaking ever. Thank you. That's what I always taught as well. Maybe we'll have to write a book together. <laughs> yes, we'll have to Network do one on public speaking. Sales. We can get yeah, and get, we can get Alicia to come in and speak as well. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and um, earlier, well, you mentioned about giving your time, mm. and I know you've always been mm. great at giving back, you and your wife, Rachel, and mm. you've done lots of fundraisers. And yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you said it's important when you do them to always, um, you know, do something that you're passionate about, a cause that you love, mm. because then you yes. give, you're coming from your heart. Do you want to talk about a couple yes. that you've done? Because I know, you know, cancer is on the rise and also, yes. you know, suicide and things like that. Yeah. Look, I was, uh, I first, when I came out to uh, where we live outside of Sydney, we had involved with Lifeline MacArthur, which does the counselling for suicide prevention and all that, which is cool. Uh, they've done a fantastic job and, I was unfortunate I lost my uncle to suicide mm -hmm. and I, I know unfortunately what people go through the, the on the outside, the people who, who were still around after they've passed. And then we got involved with a uh, charity called Camp Quality, which looks after children and their families on the uh, cancer journey up to the age of 13. I've been with them now for, for uh, going on 13 years. Right. And I love it. Look, I do the... The camps, where we go out with the kids, spend one, two, three, four days with them, uh, and they're an absolute ball. Remember, I'm dealing with kids age four yeah. in most of mine, up to 13, but I normally do up to four. And it's a unique experience. You get so much more out of it than you realise. It's sort of taking the soul out, scrubbing it, and then putting it back in. Because wow. I believe in giving without expectation. And these kids give so much. And I've been next to kids who were saying, are you going to come next year? And one young boy said to me, I don't even know if I'm going to be here. Oh, bless. Uh, I've been with grandparents when they've told us when we're mucking around with one of the little kids and they've just shook their head. And then I've seen the other side, the, the joy of a little boy or girl that spent the day so their parents can go and spend time with their brother or sister who doesn't get that time. Uh, we lose these days, when I started, about 24% of children with cancer. I think it's down to about 18 or 19% now, which is excellent. Uh, but I believe in being in a charity that is close to your heart. It can be your local cricket side, your local soccer side. It doesn't have to be camp quality or lifeline or anything like that. I believe if you find what you what is truly in your heart that you can make a little bit of difference, the butterfly effect that you have on people's lives when you do something goes truly around the world. And you, you never know, all of a sudden, something comes back and you go, wow, I did that years ago and it's still out there. And I've never failed. I've seen people come to our events we had a group from the National Australia Bank NAB and they had part of their, they had was come and help at one of our big weekends and they didn't know what to do. They were putting on a disco and they were a lot of, a lot younger than us and they didn't know how to talk to the kids, they didn't know anything and they just thought they'd do the disco and then disappear. And we went, no, you got to come and sit and have dinner with us. Oh, can we? And they, just, we just won them over. The kids won them over. These kids are full of life. And it was, you just see the change, it changed their, changed their life, these young adults. 
And, beautiful. you know, just find somebody that you love. Yeah. doesn't matter if you spend four hours a year, but you'll make someone's life. You'll change. You could change someone's life. You could cha- save their life. But I'll tell you what, at the end of the day, you don't do it for the gratitude, but when you finish doing it, uh, it does make you feel very good. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's what I say to people. The best gift you can give someone is your time. And, mm. you know, you know, Priceless. And be of service, you know. Without any expectation, like you're saying. Um, what about from the fundraising side? Because, you mm. know, from the sales side, how easy or not is it to get people to donate to these charities, et cetera? To me, it's a lot easier than it is for a lot of people. But people will not donate to your charity unless they know you're 100% in, that it, you're, you're coming from the heart. So... To ask someone to donate a service or money, they need they will read you within the first 30 seconds. If you have a prepared script, if you have all of this, they won't even go near you. To me, the only way that you get money out of people is one-on-one. It's not over the phone. And it has to be reciprocal. They have to get something back in return. doesn't matter if they never use it. But they need to know that either they're getting something back, being signage or whatever, if it's a sponsorship. Or if I give you $100, what is that going to have? What difference is that going to make? What is that going to buy? And you'll be surprised if you say, look, for every $100 donation, that gives us whatever, whatever. You're not asking for $100, remember? I just said for every $100 donation, you can do this. Or for every $500 we raise, we get to send a child away on camp for two days. What they've heard is, well, if I donate $500, I can fund a child. You never ask them. Yeah. It's a it's a play on words. But uh, with what we do and how we do, and I have a charity bash car that my wife and I run, I have 100% success. If I put my arm around you and walk you towards that car, you will not come back without giving me money. That's wow. my belief. That is a personal belief. And that's the way I act. I do not get offended if people say no. But I can read them. And if they're saying no for the right reason, that I truly can't afford it or the business, I have not a problem with them at all. But people who say no just because they're mean, I actually feel sorry for them. But uh, I've had had people who supported us for 10 years. And out of that 10 years, there may have been three years in that 10, they couldn't give us money. I've still looked after them. Because I'm a strong believer in karma. Yeah. But you know what? You're coming from the right place. People will see that and they will donate. That's fabulous. You know, you just have to be an open book and an open heart. And thank you. Yes, exactly. And it's great talking about open hearts that um, Rachel, you know, and you work closely together. She's helped you with your book. Mm and with the charities and she's very much i believe come from a corporate background you mentioned she worked with politicians but now she's starting out on her own isn't she doing a new business so maybe you can tell us if rachel would be okay with that what is she experiencing because so many people are starting up their own businesses like to go out and it's you know like I say to pe- people, it's like Seinfeld. When he stands on mm. the stage, it gets them to imagine everybody naked so, you know, you can be funny. Mm. But you are, personally, it's like an artist showing their painting. You know, you're raw, you're naked, you're vulnerable. It's out of mm. your comfort zone. How has she felt? It is, a, yeah, it is out of her comfort zone, but she always had the skills. Right. She just had to apply the skills in a different way. People, I had a mate of mine who lost his job. He's saying, I can't get my job, I can't get this, I can't get that. And I said, well, write down your skill set, not who you worked for, write down your skill set. And so what my lovely wife has done is taken the skill set she learned of dealing with very, very well-known people, very well-known politicians, working in an office where you can't make a mistake because it ends up on the, on the news wire, and applying that to business. It's the same thinking, the same methodology. But when you're, when you're being, what she is, is a buyer's agent in Australia where she buys homes for people, which is one of their biggest investments, 
that they'll ever make, they've got to be confident in what she does and how she does. So she had all the skill set. She just had to learn to apply. And the only way to do it is to jump without a parachute. Because I believe you'll always fly. Take that jump. And I can tell you now, if you truly believe you, believe yourself and believe in yourself and learn and open your eyes, you'll be successful. And she is being very successful now. Yes, we, you know, the first time she went out there, she was all nervous. And like, this is, you know, something I couldn't do. Now it's just, you know, it's rolling off. It's, 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 she's found her groove, which is fantastic. So it doesn't matter. Everyone sees you had three careers in your life. Most of the time it's the same skill set just applied three different ways. Wow. That's a great and way that's of all it is. It and back yourself. I mean, you just got to get out there and have a go. These people who make excuses not to do something, they irritate me. I'd rather swing and miss yeah. than never swing at all. You know, go like, out and lose a couple of golf balls. Yeah, you're like still you going to get eventually, you're going to get a few in the hole. <laughs> like you said, it's so important to make mistakes. And I believe we all it learn is. from our mistakes. That's the only time we grow. Mm. Well, not the only time, oh. but we it's a great opportunity to grow when we make mistakes. Look, I'm very proud of her. She's uh, gone in completely and yeah. put 100% into it. And she's now starting to see the fruits come through. And I say that to anyone, you know, just have a good go. Yeah. And like you talk about be, coming from your heart as well, when you, you're passionate about anything, mm. you know, you are putting 100 or 110% in and usually mm. it will pay off and people feel that passion and that energy and people are willing to support mm. you when they know that you're so passionate. So Look, if you, we've had people walk up to us and be very genuine and say, look, you know, I've, I've got no need for your services, but I will refer you or, and they do. You know, if, if, you, if you are kind of heart and true, it'll come back to you. Thank you. That's wonderful words. Um, just on a closing note, if there was one thing mm -hmm. that you could do to change the world, what would it be? Wow, that's a good one. I would say I would get a lot of these people who make decisions to stop and listen. You don't have to agree. Just stop and listen. People don't do enough of it. Wonderful. That is so true. And um, the, for me, the best gift to anyone is that you truly listen because mm -hmm. they feel heard and they feel that you're there for them because we're mm -hmm. always, since a child, we're looking for the path of approval from our mother, father, or whatever, mm -hmm. just the recognition and we're all living in a fast-paced world. Um, we're all mm. trapped in our mind with our disempowering thoughts. So to be able to stop and just listen, that's wonderful. So It's, it's a, one of the most important rules of sales. <laughs> and also it networking. Is. Yeah, I know. <laughs> networking, sales, life, and relationships yes. where you don't listen to your other half. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I think it's good that you're that you had the courage to give your book to Rachel. Because mm, I trust. No, because Brian always says to me, I give you all the advice, but you don't listen. But someone else tells you mm. exactly the same. And I know that's part of my disempowering beliefs because I don't want to let him down if I fail or whatever. But he is my number one support fan and mm. I'm very blessed to have him as you are with Rachel. So yeah. I think... I am blessed and uh, I completely trust her. So yeah, so... Sometimes it's hard to let go in sales when you've been very confident all your life. Mm. Letting go and trusting someone can be very tough. But I tell you what, once you do, it's empowering. 